it seems that electricity prices and energy costs are only getting higher. Uh, I mean, is this is this going to change that? Is is this going to make energy cheaper for people? Because I look at my energy bill, and apparently I'm with a company that gets it from 100% renewables. And my energy bill just seems to be going up in price every year, and my consumption isn't all that different. But uh, it's the the cost of energy continues to rise. I mean, is this going to bring cheaper days? Welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. Want to be a better, smarter, more clued up investor? Well, you've come to the right place. We cover the breakthrough investment ideas you don't hear about in the mainstream to keep you on top of the mega trends and opportunities reshaping our world. Good morning and welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. I'm your editor, Sam Volkering, here with my co-editor, Kit Winder. Thanks again for joining us, Kit, on what, where I am at least, is a reasonably hot uh, day. Hot, hot day. <laughs> it's sunny, it's hot, and uh, it's uh, unusual weather for the United Kingdom in what is now September. Crazy. Climate change, mate. Come on. I'm going to fall for it. I'm going to talk about something called climate divergence, where essentially hot and dry places are getting hotter and drier and cold and wet places are getting colder and wetter in lots of scenarios. So I think one of the, the defining themes of the European summer has been that here in the UK, it's been like 18 to 22 degrees and cloudy and grey and rainy and pretty average. Um, but in Greece, they've had wildfires and it's been 45 degrees. And I think um, it's like it's a pretty perfect storm really where the problems that you already had are getting worse rather than um it's not like the uk is suddenly going to become the south of france which is maybe what people were hoping for no no we want it to be the champagne region don't we i mean we talked about this the other week for the british wine industry i mean this is this is this has got to be good news doesn't it for for the for, for, for climate change advocates or dissidents or I'm not really sure who, but surely, surely the industries have got to benefit from this. Anyway, I don't really want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk to you about something else, which is actually, funnily enough, energy related, which I think is probably one of the biggest stories of this week, uh, which doesn't seem to be getting a lot of attention. And I can probably understand why. And you may have some views on, on why that might be in, in a minute. Uh, but it was around the it was around the switching on again, or at least tapping into the uh, the backup energy required and created from a coal-fired power plant because um, not enough wind, apparently. So they had to, the UK switched on uh, some some uh, energy from, from a coal-fired power plant to supplement uh, the, the, the national grid, effectively. Um, I mean, what do you what do you make of this, kid? Is, is this, like we've talked about the energy transi- transition before. Obviously, and we talk about uh, a switch over to electric vehicles. Uh, there's, you know, great goals and, and plans and policies in place to achieve, you know, net zero and all these wonderful ideas. And, and look, don't get me wrong, great technologies. All of, you know, if we can move to sustainable renewable energy that's good for the environment and still lets everybody juice up their phones so that they can get online and tweet about all these things. Um, you know, that's that's good if it does less damage to the environment. But are we going to have problems uh, in a world which is ever more thirsty for energy? Um, are we going to have enough renewable energy to to hit the national grid, to, to provide the energy that everybody needs? I mean, energy demand isn't exactly going to decrease anytime soon. Um, are we going to have to rely on dirty fuel backups to to provide a backstop i suppose or or is or is are we is this just you know a non-event uh it's not a non-event i think it's just quite a sort of interesting reminder that what what we're currently trying to do uh is build a new energy system from scratch that we don't really know anything about or understand and it's a lot of guesswork has been involved up until now and um, you know, brilliant people can build models of what a good energy system looks like in the future. But when, you know, one wind park fails for technological reasons and wind is low and, you know, energy prices have been rising through the summer because of shortages, you can just get these little perfect storms. And yeah, so the uh, the price of wholesale electricity in the UK is usually around £50 per megawatt hour. Um, 
it spiked and it hit 200 this week, I think. So there's a confluence of long and short-term factors that have happened. It's clicked up into gear and we turned on a cold pump, which I think made something like £2,100 per unit of electricity sold. Um, so wait, like it made an absolute killing from it. And um, yeah, it raises all those kind of questions. I think probably what it means is just that um, we haven't yet perfected these kind of systems yet. There's definitely still going to be a place um, for things like gas fired power plants, I'd say much more than coal um, in the future, because as you say, renewables are intermittent. You probably need, let's say 120% of your your average or 150% of your average daily need um, catered for by renewables, by solar and wind and, and some nuclear. Um, and that's so that even on extreme days of need, you still have 50% margin of safety, I guess. And then on top of that um, is ideally where you would want batteries to come in. And I think the answer to the, the coal thing from yesterday is if we had the adequate battery set up that a lot of people advocate for, myself included, um, the large scale energy storage maybe in the form of hydrogen stored in caves which is generated by that extra 50% of renewable electricity that we don't need most days can go into generating hydrogen then used as storage or going into whatever um, product it's being used as then we also have that storage available for when we need it so I think um, yeah this is an example of what will happen the only difference should be that in the future we have long-term storage solutions that can be easily switched on and that are still essentially renewable electricity just stored from, you know, a few days or a week earlier. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess my question is, where are these, where, where's, where's the batteries? Where are, where's the home, where's the market? Where, where are the suppliers of, of the home batteries that we all, you know, could use and need and, and store up energy with and, and then you know tap into in in peak times or you know when we can build up uh, these energies from renewables. Um, it seems like the market hasn't arrived yet. I guess my question is: Is it going to arrive anytime soon? Are we going to see a a great deal more selection or even a selection of storage solutions that people can use, or is it not really a a, a thing that individual households will be doing? Is it that the, there needs to be more infrastructure storage? Uh, in the grid? And, and if so, where's where's that coming from? Yeah, I mean, great question. To me, it's nice because it, it it's a sort of perfect echo of a question that we would have had maybe three or four years ago with electric vehicles or six or seven years ago with solar and wind. And it's an echo of a question that I imagine you hear a lot, which is this has been promised for a long time and we still haven't seen it. But in the background, between batteries 10 years ago and batteries today, even if it's gone from you know, 0.1% adoption with power plants to 0.5%. Most people don't notice that because it's not in their homes. They don't notice it on their energy bills and it's not really in the news either. But that jump from 0.1% to 0.5% has been massive. And in that period, so since 2010, for example, the cost of a, a lithium ion, ion battery has come down by 90%. So there's been an incredibly significant revolution in the cost and availability of batteries. And so, yeah, a huge number of things have happened off the back of that electric vehicles have become a lot cheaper technology allowing electric vehicles to then recharge back to your house have become commercially available and are being included in more and more fleet and passenger vehicle solutions from now so in the example of a blackout uh, i literally saw someone posting about them doing this on twitter yesterday um they use their hyundai ionic model ionic with a q obviously obviously um <laughs> they they suffered a power cut and their car then saved the contents of their fridge and freezer. And it's like, yeah, it's not a massive deal, but it's cool and it's useful. And um, essentially what needs to happen on the grid scale is that exact same thing, but using much larger solutions. So lithium ion has some limitations the bigger you go. Um, and there are maybe solutions which are different, like, um, yeah, green hydrogen produced by the excess renewable electricity that, that is above and beyond the demand that we have on an average day could be going and being stored in salt caves and then re, uh, re-electrified when we need it. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of your personal house, that's one solution. They're coming onto market more and more. BP and Shell have both bought companies that are doing this. Tesla are ramping up their battery business slower, obviously, than Elon Musk promises, as always, but it's still happening. Um, and then, yeah, private and public companies along the chain 
are working too. In fact, this evening after we record, a company called Sela Nanotechnologies is going to be making a pretty big announcement about their battery, which I think a lot of people are pretty excited about. So um, even though it's, a lot of it's gone under the radar, the last five or 10 years have seen huge, huge steps forward. And what we'll see in maybe three years time or five years time for batteries is what we're currently seeing with electric vehicles, where there's this explosion of models into the public market space. There's this explosion of interest in the media and, and in politics, and people suddenly realize how brilliant these things are and, and how much they can contribute to our future renewable energy mix. That's that's great. And don't get me wrong, I'm all, I'm all for it and I'm very excited about what's coming. But it seems that electricity prices and energy costs are only getting higher. Uh, I mean... Is this is this going to change that? Is is this going to make energy cheaper for people? Because I look at my energy bill, and apparently I'm with a company that gets it from 100% renewables. And my energy bill just seems to be going up in price every year, and my consumption isn't all that different. But uh, it's the the cost of energy continues to rise. I mean, is this going to bring cheaper days for the average, you know, the person that's out there grinding away? that's paying more and more for goods and services in the economy. Things like energy is getting more expensive. Uh, you know, is this going to bring it short term or is, is this just something that we're going to have to get used to higher energy prices until these things come online in another five, 10 years time. And just, I guess people have to suck it up until that actually comes. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, at the moment we're seeing oil, coal and gas, prices rise very significantly. So that is behind most of the broader rises in energy bills across this country, across Europe and in America as well. Um, in terms of renewable energy over the last 10 years, that has, those have come down, as I say, batteries 90%, uh, solar 85% and wind about 50% in terms of their costs. So they're now achieving cost parity. They're cheaper than coal in two thirds of the world. Uh, solar recently broke a new record, again, its own record for the cheapest uh, energy ever produced in history at something like 0.13 cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. Uh, I've got my figures mixed up there, but um, it's the new record. And so the general trend of renewable energy should be towards zero because that is the marginal cost of producing once the asset is in place. The difficult thing is actually the business model from the producer's side. So um, as I say, you're going to need more than 100% of your usual demand in solar and wind because of the fluctuations in demand. Um, and that means that for large parts of time, um, maybe if you own 50 of the 100 solar farms in the UK, to just give you know a, a childish example, maybe you can only run 30 of those every day and 20 of those are, are switching on and off. And that's called curtailment when you're not actually allowed to sell the power that your plant is producing. Um, and so from a business model perspective, your costs are going towards zero. You can't actually sell the electricity you're generating the whole time. It's very difficult. And that's where something like hydrogen comes in, where the excess electricity can go towards something that's useful and profitable. Um, and so curtailment is then reduced um, and the business model becomes more attractive. Um, yeah, as I say, it's quite an interesting sort of competitive environment when people can kind of like if it's a really windy or a really, really sunny day, People can just produce electricity for, you know, next to nothing. Um, so that's something we should see coming our way in general more and more. We should also see less fluctuation in our energy bills. Um, because, as I say, the power agreement on a solar farm is generally agreed for 25 years. It's called a power purchase agreement. They're doing this with, so Hinkley Point is quite a famous example because they agreed it in 2000. And, 12 i think and it was something about like 90 pounds per megawatt hour which was already as you know 40 pounds above the average wholesale price in the uk and they also tied it to inflation so that's already ramping up towards 120 125 pounds per megawatt hour which is then 150 percent higher than the average wholesale price and it's not even started generating yet it's still way way over cost way behind delay so that's a bad option but inflation will still sort of impact energy prices as the cost of everything in the UK everything in the world goes up and that's a whole different conversation what inflation is going to be but the general trend of solar and wind prices should be slowly towards uh, zero because that's the marginal cost of production once once the asset is in place 
Yeah, I, I certainly think that the faster there can be domestic affordable uh, options for people to generate and store their own electricity and not have to rely so much on uh, large-scale infrastructure you know, providers uh, that to, to provide you know their own household energy uh, that shift can't come fast enough because it seems like uh, <laughs> whether it be you know these companies still need to and want to generate profits uh, and certainly doesn't feel like uh, that the, I guess, the energy markets and the cost of energy for the average person is trending down anytime soon. So hopefully the technology's come fast enough to the domestic uh, end user that they can do it somewhat themselves without having to fork out a massive capital outlay and see the payback in 10 years' time, uh, often in properties that they probably will move from in that space anyway. Uh, but we have banged on long enough. Um, that's fascinating insight as to how the energy markets work and the renewable markets work, which I'm sure people will be fascinated to hear about because um, it's one thing to understand what's coming. It's another thing to understand what's happening now. And then obviously uh, what most people relate to is the money that comes out of their pocket to pay for all this. Um, so hopefully we can see those costs come down in the near future. Uh, but thanks again, Kit, for your insight today. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. And we'll be back with you again next week with another Exponential Investor Podcast.